We're going to have another look at a recessionary gap and try to make a com uh, direct comparison between what we see here, which is the neoclassical or monetarist uh, viewpoint, and then what we see in the Keynesian view of aggregate supply. And it's important that we understand how these view it differently because it explains why they advocate for different policies when the economy is in a deflationary gap. Now, remember a, a recessionary gap or a deflationary gap. Um, the point is, is that we're not at a place where our short-run equi equilibrium, where aggregate demand meets short-run aggregate supply, that equilibrium point Y1 is not occurring on long-run aggregate supply. So in this case, it's not really important to think about long-run equilibrium. Um, you can't really see it. The point is, we don't have it. We only have short-run equilibrium, and we're not in a point of equilibrium in the long run. So let's look at during a contraction or recession if you prefer, but remember a recession has to be six months. Anyhow, let's look at characteristics of a recession. Without even getting into mumbo jumbo about C plus I, etc., keep in mind when we talk about an economic recession, businesses are hurting. Because businesses are hurting, they're laying people off. They're having to uh, let go of people, so unemployment is higher. Because unemployment is higher or people don't have jobs, obviously they're not spending very much money, but also people who do have jobs maybe aren't gonna spend much money either because they're scared, they're concerned. Remember, an important determinant of C is expectations of future income. If the person who works in the office next door to me just lost their job, maybe I'm concerned about losing my job too, so I'm gonna cut back on my own spending. So what we're going to see is aggregate demand is going to be low for all of these reasons. Consumption is low, like we just talked about. It starts with investment being low. Businesses are afraid to spend money. If that's true, then, business, uh, then taxes from the government should be low, and they shouldn't be spending much money either. Now, obviously, in the modern day, businesses do spend a lot, I'm sorry, governments do spend a lot of money during a recession, but that's because most of them don't ascribe to this belief. If governments only spent the amount of money that they brought in, which is called a balanced budget as opposed to a deficit budget, well then government spending would also decrease because these two had decreased. We didn't talk about it before, so maybe now's the right time. When we look at net exports, really the effect on net exports can be quite different for uh, various countries. It's likely that your import spending will go down because a lot of what you're consuming and maybe what business or businesses buy, maybe they're buying it from foreign producers. If that's true and they're spending less, they're also going to spend less on imported products. However, that might not be true. If you live in a country where uh, consumer products are expensive, but a country that's close by has lower prices, you might actually buy more stuff from them because of that lower price. So that's why it really is, it really does depend. If import spending does go down, that would actually have a positive effect on um, aggregate demand. Because remember, net exports is X minus M. So if I'm subtracting a smaller number, aggregate demand would rise. However, that's likely to be met by a decrease in exports too, because recessions tend to be regional, they tend to, you know, jump borders. It might also be true that the countries that you export to are going through the same thing, so they're also buying less things from you. So we don't want to say anything hard and fast about net exports. They're likely to also be um, reduced during a time of recession, but we don't always know. Okay. So remember we're looking at the monetarist or neoclassical perspective here, and for them, the whole idea is leave it alone, laissez-faire, because it will take care of itself. It's self-regulating. So the question is, how is it going to self-regulate? Well, we've just shown that the problem here is that aggregate demand is too far to the left. It's not where it should be because of uh, decreases in C, I, and G. So if it's the problem, it's not going to just turn around fix itself. If aggregate demand has decreased to here, there's no reason for it to stop decreasing and just to go back where it was. So here's how the argument goes. B 
Because y1 is less than yfe, this is our recessionary gap right here. Because of that, this unused capacity, yfe minus y1, that represents a certain amount of people who are cyclically unemployed in factors of production that aren't being used either. So eventually, not at first, but eventually these people who are out of work, they will start to, they will begin to be willing to accept a lower wage. As that happens, the second that they're willing to accept a lower wage, what happens is that short run aggregate supply will shift to the right. Remember in the short run, the difference between short run and long run is uh, in the short run, input prices are fixed. Well, if input prices begin to fall, remember the major input price is wage. So the second I'm willing to accept a lower wage, input prices have fallen. The second that happens, we have a new short run, and that means that at each price level, we're able to produce more than we previously were. That means we get short run aggregate supply shifting from one to short run aggregate supply two, something like this. So once short run aggregate supply has shifted to the right and has shifted to the right far enough, so this is probably not just gonna be one shift of, of short run aggregate supply, but several shifts of short run aggregate supply, we eventually get to a point where the pressure, and again, the pressure means where we have this unused capacity so we get to this point here where this pressure, the unused capacity is gone, therefore there's no reason for it to continue to happen. And that's why we call it long run equilibrium when our equilibrium point between short run aggregate supply and aggregate demand occurs on the long run aggregate supply curve. Now, there is, as, as we talk about input prices falling, you have to keep in mind that there's a snowball effect or if you prefer a domino effect. I kind of like snowball effect more though because you know as a snowball rolls downhill, by the way I've seen it happen, it's pretty cool. Anyway, um, as a snowball rolls downhill, it doesn't just get bigger but it gets exponentially bigger, um, which is a little bit different than dominoes, right? So what we have to keep in mind is as one person lowers their wage, that company is more able to not only supply more at the one price, but they're also able to supply the same amount at a lower price. So if they're producing something that is then an input to another company, so if I'm producing, um, you know, I'm taking wheat and turning it into flour, well now bakers, they can buy flour for a lower price. Even if it's not an input for another company, other people, because uh, consumer goods are cheaper, other people will also be willing to take a pay cut or are less uh, concerned about maybe taking a pay cut because prices are beginning to fall. So because of wages and prices falling, that's the mechanism that allows short run aggregate supply to shift to the right. So as long as wages and prices do fall, as long as this pressure of unused capacity exists, short run aggregate supply will shift to the right and eventually we'll get to um, a point of long run equilibrium. And the point is it did it itself, the government didn't need to. But the way the Keynesians see it, before that happens, before all that self-regulation occurs, we'll all be dead. Keep in mind, the Keynesians don't argue that self-regulation won't occur. They argue that because the economy is so big and so complex, that to go through the process of self-regulation is gonna take too long, and it's gonna be too painful of a period. Keep in mind, Keynes is writing in response to the uh, 1929 He's writing in response to the Great Depression. And uh, during that time, at the outset of this in the U.S., the president is a guy named Hoover. And you've probably heard of the Hoover Dam. Uh, there's actually another funny story that relates about that, but we'll save that for another day. But um, as this happened, and Hoover was of the mindset of laissez-faire, leave it alone, as the Great Depression got worse and worse and worse, and all these people were losing their income, their wealth, their houses, their livelihood, um, there was a growth of like informal set of settlements in all the major cities of the U.S. Well, these informal settlements were referred to as Hoovervilles, and they weren't saying it as like, you know, we love President Hoover. They were blaming President Hoover for where they were. So that's the point in the Keynesian view. Yeah, self-regulation might occur, but the cost to human um, 
welfare, the cost of standard of living is too great for us to wait that long. So we have to intervene sooner. Okay? Remember, the reason the Keynesians argue that uh, self-regulation is going to take a long time is because of sticky wages and prices. Okay, so let's play a quick game of would you rather. I don't know if you know this game or not. Would you rather have a job with prices going up or not have a job and prices being stable or falling? I think that's a pretty easy choice. If I don't have a job, it doesn't matter what prices are because I don't have any money. Keynes says because of sticky prices and wages, um, there's going to be no self-regulation. Keep in mind here, there is no short-run aggregate supply curve. So, Keynes says what has to happen is that aggregate demand has to shift to the right, and that's going to happen from increases to cheap. Keynes wouldn't disagree with what we said on the previous whiteboard, that C is not going to increase on its own, neither is I. But, he says it's okay for the government to spend more than they bring in in tax revenue. So, that's going to represent uh, increased G, and it's going to be, if you think about the circular flow, the tax leaving is going to be smaller than the government spending coming in, so it's going to expand the circular flow. Going back to a bit of American history, the American president who practiced this is a guy named uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and his economic plan was uh, nicknamed the three R's. Well, the third one, reform, we're not going to really talk about, but that was like fixing the system so that the uh, stock market crash and other things didn't happen again. Um, but the first two R's we will talk about because they are directly increases to G. First of all, relief, which is all these people who have lost their homes and don't have a way to get any food, you're going to provide them with those basics, um, you know, that humans need. Well, keep in mind, that's good for them. They have food and a place to stay, but it's also good in terms of aggregate demand because you're buying the food from someone and you're paying somebody to build the shelters or you're paying somebody to house people that they weren't housing before. So that money is going into the circular flow where it wouldn't have before. I couldn't buy the food for myself. Somebody buying the food for me, that's good for me, but it's also good for the person I bought it from. Recovery. This is uh, what we call public work. So this is when the government um, steps in and actually starts to hire people simply for the sake of uh, having them have a job. If they have a job, they're going to have money in their hands and they're going to go out and spend the money. So C is going to increase. Okay. So this first bit, relief and recovery, those are going to result in uh, what we see as a change from 81 to 82. So here's 81, and if this is why full employment over here, we have to wonder, well, where's 82 going to end up? It's actually not going to end up all the way over here. It's going to be someplace in between. So you might go, well, wait a minute. That's not right. That doesn't seem okay, because we're still a long ways away from YFE. We're only over here at Y2. So you still have a lot of people who are unemployed, cyclically unemployed. Well. Keep in mind what I just said about the effect on the circular flow. We use this term prime the pump, and I think, um, I think I showed you a video. If not, I'll maybe put it in as a link here. But you know, old-timey water pumps, to get water up out of the ground, you actually had to pour some water in uh, from the top and then start pumping, and that pouring the water in um, is priming the pump. So in economic terms, what that means is that these people, you know, these people who have their food bought or have their shelter paid for, that's money going into the circular flow, and that money's going to continue to go around. Likewise, the people who get hired, they're going to have money, and that money's going to continue to go around. So that second change, the first change is directly because of the government spending, but the second one is going to be due to the government spending, but it's actually going to be changes in C and I. Okay? So the second change, so it's the first effect and then the second effect, that second effect is going to get us all the way over here to 83, hopefully somewhere where full employment is. This second shift, so G and then the second shift here, is what we refer to as the multiplier effect. HL, you're going to have to do some math with the, what's called the Keynesian multiplier eventually. Um, anyway, so be ready for that.